The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Don't adjust your screen. There is nothing wrong. You are about to enter a world where the very concept of time is rendered obsolete by the sheer power of entertainment. You're about to enter the Bogus Hour. Welcome to another episode of The Bogus Hour, where I spend my time talking with radio DJ, author, blogger, podcaster, Mike Morin. Well, I'd like to welcome to The Bogus Hour a good friend of mine, Mr. Mike Morin, radio DJ for a long time, author, Podcaster, man about town. You kind of columnist for the Nashville Telegraph. Columnist for the that. Nashville Telegraph. We can't forget we're in Nashville. Yeah. Um, so here we are, Mike. I'd like to talk to you about your career and yep. your past mm -hmm. and your future, but I'd also like to find out why you gotta. Yeah. Can Can they see this? <laughs> yeah. This. Uh, yeah. Make sure it's the right finger. This, this. This actually happened a little earlier today, and it was sort of because of you. Yeah that I went into urgent care in Londonderry and have three stitches on this finger. Oh, boy. Yeah, and, and the, the reason was that I've been uh, working up a, a new presentation having to do with food, food hacks, you know, shortcuts in the kitchen are like the big thing right now. So I'm, I've been coming up with uh, and researching all these different kinds of things you can do with food and make them in a couple minutes. Like you can make a chocolate cake in a coffee mug in about a minute and a half. Heard of it? Yeah. yeah. And, but there's a lot of other even stranger out of the way things, and that includes potato chips in your microwave, microwave oven. Okay. Now that one most people haven't heard of because not heard of that. Uh, getting them thin is the difficult part. So how do you do it? You get something called a mandolin, which is not, not the instrument, but it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of a, an angled flat board and it's oh, got a little blade yeah. that sticks up. So you just, almost like cutting lunch meat, you just slice, slice, slice. Okay. But there's a little thing you're supposed to put on top of the food you're slicing. So that you're not... Will, yeah. Smashing your I hand. Said, I don't need that. <laughs> I'm a highly trained professional. So I sliced a potato, and then at one point uh, I noticed there was blood, and oh. I went right into my <laughs> finger. Now, I, I didn't bring those along, but I did bring you oh, no. some potato chips. Oh, okay. And I don't know if, if you're allowed to have that, but sure. I defy you to, to tell me that these were actually made in a microwave oven. Really? Yeah. Well, they, they sure do look like... I'm, I'm just checking for blood. <laughs> <laughs> a good Because they look pretty tasty. Uh, okay, th all right. Now, those are a little bit dark. And, I, and I did want to say, you were yes. talking about shortcuts in the kitchen. Three stitches is a shortcut. <laughs> yes, it is. So, we're going to go. All right, we're going we're gonna to try this, folks. If I uh, don't make it out of this taste test, Mike Morin is had the crew prime tested. suspect number yeah. one. <laughs> now, you... Folks at home can probably hear the crunching. Yeah, uh, that's uh, and uh, so that's how, do you think, how do you think I made them? I mean, what what's they're not deep fried. You get the mandolin, and without your finger part in there, okay. you slice them off a little less than an eighth of an inch. You put them on uh, some cooking Ooh, paper. Tasty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, just a little bit of uh, olive oil on it, a little bit of salt. Yeah. You put it in the microwave for four minutes on the carousel, and you take it out, and you have really the, the only. Uh, Potato chips that I like better than those are Cape Cod. Yeah, I have that's to say, very I, good. You can't do, yeah, thank you. And those are yours to keep, by the way, as a, as a thank you for having me on the bogus album. But there's no finger. There's no finger. No, right no, here. no. I made sure that there was no finger right. parts in there. So I have you to thank for my three stitches. <laughs> <laughs> While but, you're making food for me. Well, that's what's going to happen eventually is I'm, I have the show. It, it's going to be hopefully about 45 minutes of all kinds of food hacks and, and things in the kitchen. That, that you can do real fast. I think college kids will like it. But, uh, but you'll have me back then, when, and it, maybe I can do like a five-minute set or something. Yeah, well, sure, we'll have a little, we'll set up a little, maybe a little kitchenette here. Yes, if I have any digits oven. left. <laughs> 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 but 
But anyway. Like, like the shop guy, like the shop teacher. Remember the shop oh, teacher? Yes. I was missing several <laughs> digits. Okay, so that's your, your current, uh, your, one of the current things you're doing. Let's all dial it way back okay. to the beginning of the Morin story. Yes. Oh, that bleed, bleed that begins in, uh, around uh, Detroit. It does, yes, yeah, suburban. Actually, it's about 200 miles north of Detroit, where for my first radio job in 1971, I drove weekends to work 16 hours for $1.60 an hour. Wow, I have that right there, $1.60 an hour. That yeah, is... that's true. And, I, uh, and, well, and, ago, and so back then, was that considered all right money? That was minimum wage. <laughs> they, they couldn't legally and so that was your you. first job? That was my at first radio, radio job. But I was in college at the time, and I was still working at McDonald's as the night maintenance guy, oh. making two and a quarter an hour. So I'm, I'm making more money at McDonald's <laughs> than I am in my chosen career. Wow. But I was very lucky. I got a job while I was a sophomore in college, and by the time I graduated a couple of years later, I moved into a lower management position and a, and a midday show at a station in Ann Arbor. And um, it's been, you know, 45 years of doing what you want to do is I feel so blessed because at 11 years old, I knew that I wanted to do radio. So what was it at the age of 11 that made you want to do radio? Well, I was living in suburban Detroit at the time, and uh, I was uh, taking the bus every day to school yep. in the morning. We're talking late 50s, early 60s. And then we moved to a 19, place. 1950s, 60s? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I know. I know. So uh, then we moved to another place where I, uh, there was no bus service. It was three miles away. My parents had to drive us. So that meant I was exposed to morning radio for the first time. Ah. And uh, what I'm hearing is because radio was a lot more fun and, and creative and less uh, restrictive then. And what I heard was so much fun. The, 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 what the people were having a great time. And I said, I have to do that someday. I mean, there was, that was essentially when that whole genre was being created, right? That's pretty so. true because uh, prior to, say, the mid-50s, radio was what we see on TV now, you know, Amos and Andy, Fireside Chat with President Roosevelt. Right. And then when television came in, uh, there was no, they, they could move all those types of shows onto TV, which left a lot of open space for people called disc jockeys. And they would play the records and, and develop these massive followings. I mean, DJs in the 50s, and 60s were gods. They were the sure. big superstars. So I got in kind of at the end of that, but I also worked at places where there was pretty high visibility. Uh, and, and for instance, I worked for Kurt Gowdy Station, WCGY uh, in Lawrence. Which Lawrence's. I remember it as the Rock Guard. The Rock Guard. Yeah, which That's was right. a, great, a great tagline. I remember that was in like really yeah. cool 70s commercial with the Rock Guard. Yeah, I'm like, right. oh, man, that's far out. And, and that was one of the last mom and pop stations. They're all owned now by these conglomerates. Of they own multiple stations, multiple media outlets, and things like that. Yeah. And it's the leeway that people have is a lot less. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I pulled a stunt in Nashua in, uh, in 2000 when I was working for then WHOB, which is now Frank FM, uh -huh. uh, with the Tall Ships, and uh, where I announced <laughs> that the, uh, the Tall Ships had actually broken away from Charlestown Navy Yard in Boston came up past uh, Newburyport and down the Merrimack River and, <laughs> and, and uh, basically docked at the Sangus Arena. <laughs> and people believed it. Now, this is 2000. Oh, you got man. front page coverage in the National <laughs> Telegraph. It was, it was my war of the worlds, I guess. Oh, that's but funny. if I would have wanted to do that just five years later at WZID, which was, uh, yeah, exactly. But well, the lawyers have to you know, tell us what you want to do and the lawyers have to okay it. And by then, I'm not interested anymore, and sure. you're just going to suck all the fun. Spontaneity. The spontaneity, and, and exactly. Excitement and, and creativity. Yeah. So sadly, radio has gone that way at yeah. a time when it really needs to be more fun because the Internet and satellite radio and podcasting and everything else is just kind of eating away at what was Yeah, there's a, whole, there's a whole different world out there now, and that it seems yeah. like a lot of those old... Um, Media sources have become really, really, you know, I was that all calcified or ossified or whatever. Yeah. They, they have an inability to to, to change, and they're gonna they're, they're gonna not change, and ultimately get get consumed by all these other that, that's more creative a, that's things. That's exactly right. And uh, atrophying, I think, maybe is the word that you're yeah, yeah. thinking of. And now, uh, if you're doing a morning show somewhere, you have to have a Facebook page that pretty much parallels what you're doing on the air. So that's another layer. And, and that's fine, because that's, that's the, the world we live in now. But it was something that I wasn't thrilled about at first. But then I realized that, yeah, you really have to uh, be part of social media, because that's where that might be an entry point for, for some new people that don't know who you are.
So I want to go back to uh, Detroit and your dollar sixty an hour job. Yeah. And then, so what was your what, what was your capacity when you were doing that? Okay, that was actually two hundred miles north of Detroit in a little town called Grayling, Michigan, which, by the way, is the archery capital of the world. That's really? it. And and the the big guy at the time was Fred Bear. He was the guy, uh, Fred Bear Bows and Arrows in Grayling, Michigan. And I do remember one time going into a restroom in town somewhere and sitting down and scrawl on the wall was uh, somebody had written. Uh, Fred Bear uses a gun, which I thought was, <laughs> for some reason I remember that 45 years later. But it was a little, it was a very small 1,000 watt radio station that you could hear for maybe 15 miles, but it was, it was radio, and it was get in there and have fun and, and start to develop a style because it takes years and years. As a comedian, you know that it takes a while to find your voice and to find out who you really are. And yeah. it's the same thing with radio, it, it, and, and as a columnist for the, for the National Telegraph, you know, it took uh, you know a couple months to see where I really fit in with uh, the kind of material I would present. Finding your mojo, as it would be. That's it, my mojo. So you have that entry job, and where do you go from there? From there, while I'm still in college, I get a gig. And in what was Detroit. your? What were you getting a degree in? College? Uh, communication studies. So, there you go. Right, and and, and all. Was that a fairly new? Uh, it was. Yeah, I think it was fairly new. It, it, in fact, the name of the department changed three times in the, the four years. Well, that explains. <laughs> I was there. Yeah, exactly. So it was really changing a lot. So uh, while I was uh, still in college, I got a, a job at a Detroit radio station, which is a big deal because that's, at the time, the number five market. And I was the overnight DJ at a, a country music station. Oh, man. W-E-X-L. I'll tell you what. Can is I say shit kicking? Is that where? Yeah, you can say shit kicking. <laughs> they may bleep it, but. Yeah. Uh, is that where you fell asleep? That's where I fell asleep. <laughs> that is where I fell asleep. That explains it. Country music, you know, I, I'm sure there are country music fans out there. And, you know, there's some guys, I think, Johnny Cash and, and Hank Williams, I think, were great. But, yeah. boy, a lot of that music just puts me right to sleep. And obviously, well, <laughs> for 45 don't, minutes. Don't forget, I'm a college student at the time. And so you've always <laughs> got homework. And then I had the, the McDonald's. I mean, I had all this stuff going on, on at once. And from 3 to 4, we did the, uh, I think it was called the, uh, the Artist Spotlight Hour. So we would take an actual 33 oh. album. And, and we Punk. put it on, track it, so people could hear the whole album. They could tape it, whatever they wanted to do. So I just kind of put my head down on the, the console there. And it's supposed to go till 4 o'clock. And I wake up with <laughs> <laughs> the sound of the needle hitting the, the label, for those that are too young to know what the heck that was. And I look up, it's like 4.03. Ooh. So I, of course, pretended like I was actually, you know, there was a technical problem. And I just started, like, doing stuff on the control board that made it sound like, we're just getting back on the air, and you know it, we were off for technical, technical reasons. You didn't do the old zip, drag the needle. Didn't across. do that one. No, <laughs> I've always loved it when they would use it as a sound. Bar. Zip. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing lost to the the sands of oh, time. Oh, I know. A lot of those great little things that were. There's a classic one, a commercial. It was an A and P commercial, and the the record skipped, and so it was come on down to your A and P and P and P and P. That was where it skipped. Um, so. When do you start moving eastward? Yeah, that was, um, all right, so from, graduated from college, working in Ann Arbor for a while. Hold on a minute. Oh. You know, I think more people need to bring you food on the bogus hour. I think you're right. Because when you do morning radio, there's people always bringing you food because they want to promote their products. Now, I saw this as an opportunity to promote the fact that I'll be doing a kind of a food gig, you know, in the future. And, um, and, and it was clearly, really good. I mean, that, that, that'd be like a, 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 a very good just uh, snack to take. I'm, I'm really, and, and I'm not trying to well, thanks. You know, impress you there. It's just extremely it's healthy, decent. too. They're yeah, not yeah. deep fried. Just a tiny bit of olive oil and salt, four minutes in the microwave. But anyway, awesome. so I'm, I'm working in Ann Arbor. Somebody hears me from a Toledo radio station, calls me, offers me a job down there. I'm Toledo. in Toledo. Wow. Yeah, the uh, glass capital of the world. We're Owens, Illinois, and that's where they make all the automotive glass. Ah, okay. Libby Owens, Ford, and all that, because Detroit is just up the road 60 miles, and that's where all the factories are. Uh -huh. So they, uh, I'm there for eight years. I do television weather there for a while. I'm writing. Oh, you were a weather guy. I was a TV weather yeah. guy. Yeah. So it was, it was really going well, and then I found out they were putting on a radio station in Washington, D.C., that was all comedy, the first that had ever been done. And what year was that? That was 1983. Three. So that was, uh, the comedy boom was, was really in the thick of it right there. It was. And that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. 
Uh, they, the, in the national what was trade it? publications, they, they put out an ad looking for, for uh, comedy jockeys or whatever they called them. What was the name of the station? It was WJOK. W oh, Joke. Oh, jeez, that's hysterical. And it had uh, W.C. Fields' uh, big red bulbous nose in the O of it. So it was sort of a, a caricature on the O. Nice. And uh, I should have brought you, because I've still got 485 business cards. <laughs> <laughs> the station failed after about a year. Sad to say, the owner of the station um, had an alcohol addiction well, problem. I'm putting it kindly and sure. just couldn't couldn't really make it all happen, but wow, when that station went on the air, it got so much publicity. Uh, Wall Street Journal, I was on CNN Headline News. Oh, wow. Uh, it got just, because it had never been done before, and it was oh. such a novelty, and it was, it was cool. We would literally play, and we had thousands of albums from comedians. I mean, Bob Newhart had 40 or 50 albums. Bill Cosby had at least 50. And then at night, between 10 and 4, we were able to play what's called unexpurgated comedy. Oh, no, which is unedited or un yeah, unfiltered, as it would that's be. That's right. And so people like Tony Fields and Richard Pryor. Red and Fox. Red Fox, <laughs> a big favorite. Because he had a ton of the, I'm trying oh. to remember what they were called, party albums, I think. Yes, I think that's right. And he had, he had like, you know, like yeah. dozens of them that were known. You'd sit around with your friends and yeah. listen and titter because it was, you know, stuff that was not. But the amazing said. thing is, we were, this is Washington, D.C., actually suburban D.C., Gaithersburg, just north. We're in the backyard of the FCC, and we're doing the seven dirty words that George Carlin says you can't say on the radio. So why was that allowed? I don't know. Is, was there some sort of a time frame? That I, I think at, at that time there wasn't the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction incident that really got everything extremely conservative again, and lawyers jumped in. I, I think um, because... The, uh, the uh, market will allow it. Whatever the market allows is what you can basically do as long as it doesn't break the law. Yep. However, that's a lot more restrictive now than it used to be. So it was still sort of the Wild West back then, and it was a format that had never been done before. And we had all these great comedians that we had access to. I remember interviewing Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller and uh, wow. Soupy Sales, who was a, a childhood um, uh, he was know, a hero of mine. He, he was from he Detroit. He was a TV show guy. Too. Yeah, in Detroit. That's where it all began. So. And he, what did they one time tell all the kids to go into their father's wallet and take the, the paper with the dead old men on it and mail it to him? That's right. And I'll send you a postcard <laughs> from Puerto Rico. That's what he said. Uh, and that, uh, and he, he eventually. And I mean, on. you imagine that now. Oh, oh God, I know. It's crazy. Oh, exactly. You lawsuits, people getting fired. We're so politically correct now. Yeah, and that, again, that was when radio was fun. And it is still in a few places, but with a lot of people keeping a real close eye on you. So you do this stint at WJOK. Mm -hmm. That's further uh, east from uh, yes. the whole Michigan From Toledo. Area, from Toledo to, and to Michigan, DC. yeah. Right. So then you, when do you want land in New England? Uh, actually, a stop in New York City, believe oh, it or okay. not. Oh, okay, New York. Yeah. When, uh, when we realized, uh, I had a buddy who did the night show, I did afternoon drive. When I saw, and we saw, that the station was starting to circle the drain, and, and we are, had already taken $100 a week pay cuts. We were making like twenty five grand at this place in 1983. Uh, we said, and we seem to have some chemistry. Why don't we put together a demo tape of us on our crosses every day, when, at the crosses when you leave your show. Next guy comes on, you kind of chat a little bit. So we did that, and we sent out 15 versions of it to consultants around the country. Well, the consultant that was consulting the Today Show and other big shows around the country loved it and got us a gig in New York City, Morning Drive. That's the good news. The bad news is we'd never worked together, we had no act, and it was just kind of... Fly by the seat of your pants. Fly by the seat of your pants, which you really can't do when you're in the number one market on one of the most listened to stations in the country. So it was really exciting and yeah I can say I worked in New York City morning drive but it was it was it was tedious it was painful and it How lasted long did about that last? six months. Six months. Yeah but from there there were other so, people. So you essentially saying you can't learn on the job in a place like that. You shouldn't. No that's something and that probably I should have had that all together like when I was in Toledo but I didn't have a partner then. I'd right. never done ensemble radio so this was my first partner. The guy is brilliant one of the best people I've ever worked with He's uh, working in uh, North Carolina now, I think. And uh, so we had an agent, uh, because you need one when you're working in New York City, came that close to working with Howard Stern oh, on WNBC. WNBC. The midday show was open, 
And so my partner and I applied for it. We met with Don Buckwald, who was uh, Howard Stern's agent. Yeah. Everybody knew who we were, um, but the midday show went to Soupy Sales. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> so my childhood idol from <laughs> Bumped Detroit you out of a job. bumped me out of a gig Great. at WNBC. So well, we ended up in, in, in Boston, which I'm thrilled with. We, to lose a job to Super Sales is a pretty good Yeah, uh, I, it's, just, it's a cap. great story to tell, right? It's a great story. So you end up in Boston. W, yeah. uh, did you end up at CGY first? Uh, no, actually, uh, a year at WZOU, oh, which is now JAMA 94.5. Okay. used to be WCOZ, which was right, which is a rocky kind of like, like Yeah, it was album rock. Right, right. This was top 40, real slick, you know, jingles, the whole deal. So we, we did mornings there, and we had a little bit more of an act. But unfortunately, because it was a new format, uh, there was four management changes in our first 12 uh, months. Well, on the fourth one, I, uh, I took the guillotine, and I was out of there. And read about it that morning in the Boston Herald in the gossip column. Oh, before you go. <laughs> yeah, so we're on the air because we always work out of the newspaper. Uh, Mike Morn and Brad Krantz are going to be fired at the end of their shifts today. So when we saw that, we thought, that's probably true. <laughs> so we started, we started saying our goodbyes on the air. Nine o'clock, the program director comes flying in the studio. He's really pissed. And he says, stop talking about that. You're not getting fired today. 10 o'clock, Mike, can I see you in the office? You're fired. <laughs> so, you know, never believe your program director. Well, that's funny, too, because radio has that really weird thing where it's like, Things happen and then, and then it's never talked about again. Like, exactly. Like this, you know, yeah. the, the media is like that. You have a, this is now the new thing, and you don't mention right. the old thing, and so it's like, yes. you know, uh, <laughs> but we got, like the we military got dictatorship it. is now in charge. <laughs> We're going to tell on the old statues. We will not talk about them anymore. <laughs> That's right. So it, it's weird reading about your uh, you're about to be firing in the paper, but it was very satisfying to be able to talk about it, and then have the guy come in and. Uh, he didn't last very long. He was gone probably in six months or so. But the weird thing is, his name was Pat McKay. And uh, fast forward to just a couple of years ago at WZID when there was going to be a programming change. I was told by the general manager that Monday morning you're going to have a new boss. His name is Pat McKay. Ah, uh, different Pat McKay. Different Pat McKay. <laughs> but, uh, but before I knew that, because he wasn't sure if, if, if this guy was the one that fired me in Boston. Now, that's fine. I'm okay with being fired. It, it happens. But the fact that the guy lied to us, you know, that, so that was my beef with him. So what I did is I, I went and I contacted all my buddies from ZOU, you know, 25 years prior, and said, we need to find out if this is the same <laughs> Pat McKay. By about midday Saturday, it was confirmed that it was a different guy. and He, he was a great boss. He's still there. And... Um, but it was just, it was weird. I said, I don't need to be working for this guy again because it's not going to be very friendly the first time I see him. Wow. So you can read about all of these stories in your book. That's correct. And how old is that? The book is, I, uh, I came out in 2013. Okay, so, so a couple so years old. A couple years old. Yeah. And that was your first book? It was. And do you think you have another one in you? I do. Cool. I do. And it's, it's going to be about, uh, about candlepin bowling, which I know sounds kind of really? crazy. Candlepin bowling is a much loved yeah, Northeastern staple of New England, right? yeah. Canadian Maritimes. And is it also called duck pin? No, duck pin is another game. Oh, okay. uh, duck pin looks like the traditional ten pins. They look like they've been squashed oh, in a vice, so right. they're shorter and okay. fatter. But you also use a ball that doesn't have holes in it, a little bit bigger than a candlepin ball and about another pound heavier. But the, the reason I want to do the, the book on candlepins is Channel 5 ran Candlepin Bowling for 40 years. Bob Gamir. Bob, well, actually, Bob Gamir did uh, Bowling for Dollars. Don oh, Gillis. Don Gillis from BZ. Was, was, uh, right. was the guy. And uh, oh, okay. the stars that came out of that show, there were times when Candlepin Bowling on Saturday would beat the Red Sox in the ratings, wow. would beat, of course, the Patriots weren't much of anything then. And uh, there is this huge following of big, big stars that you don't see or hear about anymore. And nobody's ever really written the story, the behind the scenes stuff that happened. And I did a candlepin bowling show for nine years on Channel 50, oh, and then okay. LBI out of Boston with Frank Malicote for a year. So I know all the people, I'm well connected there, and I'm gonna go get the stories that people haven't heard about the stars they love to watch on Saturday. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Was it that painful of a story? <laughs> Sorry. So uh, let's wrap it up with talking about podcasting and, and what, you, what you have planned for the future. Yeah, uh, podcasting. And I'm surprised how many people don't know what podcasting is. It's, uh, and, and you were one of my uh, guests, and I appreciate you uh, coming you. on. 
uh, yeah, podcast is an interview that is strictly on the internet. And so um, I'm one who left my job in radio at a drastic pay cut because I wanted to try new and different things while I still had my health and connections. So it's called Reset, 40 is the New Happy. And it's about people like yourself who uh, left other jobs to really go after your passion. In, in your case, it's comedy and, and television and a lot of other things, entertainment, sure. essentially. And I mean, I've talked to people who have sold jewelry and then raised um, uh, mulching worms. Oh, uh, wow. A woman who owns LaBelle Winery, Amy LaBelle, wonderful woman, was a lawyer. That didn't feed her soul, so she opened LaBelle Winery in and Amherst. What a beautiful place to have in Amherst. Oh, right? it's fantastic. Surrounded with vines. It's going to be a great yes. vineyard. It's so Manchester place. Ink Link is the website to find it on. Gets um, about 100,000 hits a month, page views, I should say. Nice. Not, not the podcast, but, but the, uh, the website. And so I'm doing that, writing for the Telegraph, New Hampshire Magazine, and um, slicing my finger so that I can make you potato chips. <laughs> and you said you're going to be working on uh, a food-based? Yeah, I'm, I've got about 15 or 20 interesting food hacks. I need to get a few more. I want to do about 45 minutes, uh, rapid, fast-paced, uh, you know, with uh, cooking plates and microwave ovens. and Because uh, nobody's really doing a, a live food hacks kind of thing. Sure. And I found out that libraries love hands-on teaching stuff. I, I, you know, I was promoting the book in libraries, and I looked around at the other stuff they did, and I said, I can come up with something else that's going to be fun, and then eventually maybe to a larger stage. Who knows? Well, this gentleman is uh, showing us that you can keep <laughs> on creating and working and yeah, doing new things. Yeah, reinventing yourself. And reinventing yourself yeah. as time goes on. Mike Morin, author, podcaster, finger cutter, <laughs> uh, morning DJ. A good friend of mine. Thanks for coming out. I'd shake your hand, but I don't want to see any more blood. Yeah, thank you. So, Thanks for having me, Greg. Thanks for coming on, Mike. Big fun. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on The Bogus Hour, email us here at thebogushour at gmail.com. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.